Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Grassroots Innovation Forum. I am Lizan Kalina. This is the first of a series of webinars under the theme Reimagining Inclusive Innovation in the Post-COVID-19 Philippines. As we all know, the world is battling the COVID-19 pandemic by engaging in the largest behavioral science experiment, and that is flattening the curve. Nations around the world scrambled to accelerate the provision of much needed help and support to its citizens. And this has affected the development goals of the Philippines, as well as the global sustainable development goals. This set of high level online fora, therefore, will provide a platform that will have a focused, proactive and intentional dialogue on inclusive innovation and how this framework can be integrated in policy making and service delivery for a more crisis resilient future. The event is not just a series of webinars, but also doubles as an action oriented policy research where the reflections, insights, and lessons gained from the discussions will culminate into the creation of a policy brief on inclusive innovation. And this is set to be released by the first quarter of 2021. This event is jointly organized by the Development Academy of the Philippines Graduate School of Public and Development Management and the United Nations Development Program in the Philippines. We also thank our partner institutions, the Honeybee Network, Department of Science and Technology, QBO Innovation Lab, Hub Brother, Zero Extreme Poverty Movement, Peace and Equity Foundation, University of the Philippines Diliman, and Upscale Innovation Hub. This first webinar will take stock, celebrate, and showcase how ordinary citizens have implemented creative and innovative solutions to respond to and cope with the many challenges they face in their daily lives, especially during the pandemic. We will meet some of these grassroots innovators and understand what defines them as a grassroots innovator. We will put a spotlight on their hacks and innovations. To formally welcome us to this event is Mr. Enrico Gaviglia, who is currently the Deputy Resident Representative of UNDP in the Philippines. He has worked for the organization for over 15 years in several capacities across regions. Between 2010 and 2016, he has been Deputy Country Director in UNDP Sri Lanka and Cambodia and has joined the Manila team in mid-July 2016 as Deputy Resident Representative. Between 2005 and 2010, Mr. Gaviglia was the head of the Trust Fund Management Unit in UN-UNDP Sudan. He is an active resource person for UNDP headquarters in the management consulting team, search for cities response, and an advisor for the setup of multi-partner trust funds. He is regularly conducting support missions across regions in aid of countries and offices in transformation, crisis, and post-conflict. Prior to UNDP, Mr. Gaviglia has worked for over five years with the European Union and the regional delegation to India, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Maldives, as well as in Montenegro, Fyrom, and the Italian ministries of defense and environment. Mr. Gaviglia is an Italian national, holds a master's degree in economics, and speaks English, French, Spanish, and Italian. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Enrico Gaviglia. Good morning, everybody. I, I should definitely view that bias a bit too, too long. By the time you actually go to the entire thing, you, you, you guys be bored. Uh, so I do apologize for that. But let me, uh, let me check. I mean, the pulse of the participant is already beyond 200 people. So it's a fantastic uh, morning, a way to start the morning. And uh, I really would like to welcome you all uh, to this first of a series of webinars on reimagining inclusive innovation in the post-COVID-19 in the Philippines. Uh, this first webinar entitled Grassroots Innovation in the Time of COVID-19 will put a spotlight on the grassroots innovators and their ingenious innovations, looking at how these contribute uh, where it matter the most to their communities. And, uh, and we will be able to reflect on how we can support them uh, and can, how we can scale these initiatives so that they can benefit also other communities. But first, uh, please let me allow to, uh, 
to uh, to give a word of thanks to our superstars we managed to uh, to put together with this uh, panel today. So we have with us the founder of the Honey Bee Network, Dr. Anil Gupta, uh, the Under Secretary of Regional Operation of the Department of Science and Technology, Dr. Brenda Nazareth Manzano, the Executive Director of QBO Innovation Hub, Ms. Katrina Chan. Dr. Anthony Sales, uh, the founder of the Grassroots Innovation for Inclusive Development Program of the DOST Region uh, 11, and that uh, will be moderating the panel discussion today. So thanks a lot for the, for the, for the commitment. Uh, special thanks also to our partner, uh, the Development Academy of the Philippines, without which this uh, uh, series would not have uh, happened, and uh, represented today by uh, our host, Dr. Lizan Parente Kalina the Senior Vice President and Dean of the Graduate School of Public Development Management. So again, I welcome you all. We also have uh, uh, reactors who will uh, join in and bring in their unique perspective uh, uh, of the sector. And they're going to uh, be represented by Dr. Luis Sison of the University of Philippines, Diliman for the academe. And then we have Mr. Roberto Calingo, the executive director of the Peace and Equity Foundation and the lead convener of the Zero Extreme Poverty Movement for the civil society and non-governmental organizations. So a long list of, uh, of a very powerful intellectual add-on to this uh, exchange today. I think it's, it's gonna be uh, fantastic to uh, change views. The rationale of, uh, of, uh, of these uh, uh, webinars is that you know COVID-19 pandemic has launched a flurry of innovation from entrepreneurs, innovators, and ordinary citizens to respond to the challenges brought about uh, by the lockdown. Leveraging on their innate, innate Filipino creativity, grassroots innovators have proposed simple but scalable solutions despite the challenges and constraints. These innovations not only represent the creativity and resilience of grassroots innovators, but are also symbolic of the challenges and the deep-seated inequalities brought about this pandemic. It is therefore important for us to take stock, to celebrate, to showcase these grassroots innovations in order to acknowledge and support the grassroots innovators who have innovated and provide solutions uh, for themselves and the communities where they belong. Our speakers and reactors today uh, will definitely provide a deeper insight into the experience of grassroots innovations, uh, also bringing the, uh, the, the knowledge and experience and exposure around the world. And the, uh, and, and the policies and capabilities needed to enable and empower uh, grassroots innovation in an ecosystem that will support the growth uh, and uh, further innovations. Um, I think we're all living in a situation in which, you know, at times the wider public uh, has felt uh, in, the, in the constraint and the pressure of the, of the crisis uh, brought upon by COVID-19 to let solution be managed by somebody else. I would imagine at times we all felt in the, in the stream of protecting ourselves from the contagious or uh, trying not to get uh, 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 touched by the virus that somebody else would have, uh, would have managed uh, the, pro the, the, the crisis response. And at times we have done that in a sort of delegation of the administration of the crisis to executive powers uh, that of course are present in the country. But I think innovations, and especially the one at grassroots level, has a very important equalizing democratic power of how instead we can actually participate in the management of a response uh, brought upon uh, the COVID challenge. So it is therefore with the everybody uh, intellectual capabilities today that I will really look forward uh, and your uh, inputs because from this a beautiful journey on the recovery is about to start. Thank you very much and have a wonderful morning. Thank you very much, Mr. Gaviglia. And of course, I would like to take on from your statement that um, we have to emphasize the end of Filipino creativity, especially by our grassroots innovators who have proposed simple but scalable solutions despite the challenges and constraints. So now we will proceed to our panel discussion. The chair of our panel, uh, discussion is the director of the DOST Region 11, that is Dr. Anthony Salas, Sesu 3, and he is a food technologist by profession. Back in the 1990s, he was able to develop products 
and processing and quality control system for manufacturing companies such as League Marine Food Products and Sirawan Food Corporation. He is also a researcher. He conducted several researches in aflatoxin and mycotoxins that were published in journals such as the Journal of Food Protection and Food Additives and Contaminants. Apart from that, he is a public servant. He started this journey with the Department of Science and Technology since 1992 and rose up from the ranks and became regional director in 2009. He leads the regional office in implementing high impact community based and new innovative programs, technology transfers and commercialization, laboratory consultancy, scholarships and other forms of science and technology interventions. Dr. Salas continues to implement programs and projects for the development of food safety, water management policies, and sustainability science. Finally, Dr. Salas also leads in the implementation of the DOSD Halal program. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Anthony Salas. So may we hear from Dr. Anthony Salas. Hi, Dr. Anthony. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Thanks to our host, uh, Dean Lizan Karante Kalina for the kind introduction. Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on grassroots innovation in time of COVID-19. I hope everyone is safe and healthy despite the challenges and changes brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Part of today's forum is a panel discussion, which will begin with a set of presentations from our resource speakers. The objective of the discussion is to showcase some examples of grassroots innovations to mitigate the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and to collectively discuss and explore ways to encourage, enable, and support the growth of grassroots innovators in the country through a multi-stakeholder approach. The discussion will also enable participants to learn from the collective global experience on enabling and empowering grassroots innovations in the Philippines. Before we begin the presentations from our resource speakers, let me provide you the panel discussion guidelines. First, this is a structured discussion session with a panel of reactors who will weigh on the presentations of the speakers with respect to the sector that they belong. Second, speakers will have 10 minutes to present their topics, while reactors will be given seven minutes to weigh in, clarify, ask questions and discuss insights on the presentations on any of the speakers. We will be entertaining questions from the audience after the presentations of all the speakers and reactors. If you wish to ask the panelists a question, please write them in the Q&A box below and indicate the name of the speaker to whom your question is addressed. We will prioritize questions in the Q&A box over those written in the chat box. First, allow me to present to you a brief background of grassroots innovations. Let us define what this so-called grassroots innovation is, who these grassroots innovators are, and how we identify and capture grassroots innovations. Let me begin by defining uh, grassroots innovations. Grassroots innovations are created by people who are affected by an issue directly or indirectly. They are not created by private companies, the academe, NGOs or government agencies, those who are members of the formal research and development and innovation ecosystem. In other words, In other words, grassroots innovations are need generated and community led innovations and solutions that respond to localized problems or challenges. In the context of COVID-19, these are innovations created at the grassroots level 
that address issues relative to COVID-19 pandemic. Grassroots innovators are those in the communities who have created, modified, improved, enhanced, or hacked a product, service, or solutions in the community. There is no specific demographic for these individuals. They may be craftspersons in an IT community who are looking to improve their tools or perhaps a mother in a household who modifies a home appliance to suit her needs and the needs of her family. So grassroots innovators could be anyone, anyone in the community who innovate with minimum resources and often depend them on the use of locally available resources. How do we define or how do we identify grassroots innovations? Identifying grassroots innovations needs community engagement. It needs field research. And that is the purpose of the UNDP Salik Lakbay Solutions Mapping. Salik Lakbay is a methodology created by UNDP Philippines Accelerator Labs, which aims to identify needs, issues, and opportunities by looking for solutions developed by the people. It is a combination of two Filipino words, taliksi, meaning to explore or research, and lakbay, to journey or go on an adventure. It is an activity that brings together curious individuals to embark in an epic journey of solutions mapping in grassroots communities. Solutions mapping is one of the principal methodologies of the UNDP Accelerator Labs that allows a deeper immersion into the dynamics of grassroots communities. The goal of solutions mapping is to identify and work with grassroots innovators who have addressed some of the most pressing social challenges in their communities. Solutions mapping changes the power dynamics between solutions developers and users. When before, the designers or developers of solutions imposed these solutions on the users. Now, what we are looking for are solutions that are user-led, solutions developed by end users for themselves, their families, and communities. These are innovations and solutions from the grassroots and for the grassroots. Given the importance of solutions mapping, especially in today's crisis, government initiatives for the grassroots engaged in practicing this methodology on Salik Lakbay. DOSD 11, in partnership with the UNDP Philippines, conducted Salik Lakbay solutions mapping to identify, map, and capture grassroots innovations in Davao region. Thank you. Now that we have already learned what are grassroots innovations, let us watch a short video co-prepared by DOSD 11 and UNDP Philippines, featuring stories of grassroots innovations or innovators with our grassroots innovations. Grassroots innovation. Uh, this term is um, is a term that we use to refer to innovations emanating from grassroots communities. The Department of Science and Technology, under the Grind program, would want to inventory and uh, determine what of these grassroots innovators and innovations we can help and we can provide science and technology interventions so that uh, they would provide uh, solutions to problems at the community level.
Sally Klakbay is a combination of two uh, ta Tagalog words, saliksik and lakbay, or paglalakbay. No? Saliksik meaning research, and then paglalakbay, adventure or a travel. Uh, that would mean that you are going on an adventure to conduct research and to learn something, to gain knowledge. So in this case, we want to gain knowledge about the communities that we want to serve by identifying grassroots innovations on the ground, at the grassroots level. I was born in Niani. Ang tanan yun, puro yun magkapait. Ang to na akong ginikanan, kay Panday man to, latero. Develop siya, huwag ka nang mga unsayang ma... pwede niyang makwartahan. So ako, naman ko yung anak, na mo yung nag-alalay sa iya. Sa iya ang pagka-wilder, wilder man po to. Pwede na ito tayo maghimo, huwag ka nang gastob. Nauna-unaan ako ni siya pag-invento, kay may kanan eh, naka-idea magkukuha ni sa una, ang tao ginagamit kini. So ang hikwan manggodani niya, ang siga niya, yung pressure, hinay. So nasulod sa kong una-una, ang anong maghimot ang una ni? Ang mas kusog ang iyang, ang iyang apoy. Nagsugod ko sa scrap. Nagpalit-palit ko katong mga parts ni niya sa mga junk. Six months, gana, before na ako siya na perfect maghimo. Nakita na ako sa kaya ako ang akong passion ko farming man. Nakita na ako ang sagay indeed sa kwan sa mga mag-uuma. Na, na ang kapobre yun. Nakita na ako mga agay ko sila mga balay. Manual-manual lang lubo sa ilang mga mais. Nga, ginagmay lang. Nga matanom sila marag kay pila lang kasalmon. Kay tungod sa ilang talang kung dagang lang itanom. Pag lubo, dugay mo man. So nakikita ko aning tawag na kaning portable. Consider, na ako nakita na ako ang mga na ipinakaguan rin ni Idri. Katong 2016, at pira palang kakilo na ilang ibaba, siguro mga sa isa kasi mana, siguro sa mga wantan lang siguro, kinagmay. Pero karoon, nag, halos nag, karoon mga portan sa awik, sobra pa diha. Nakatanom yung kong saging. Kaya tungkol sa income na kuwani, saging yung binangay. Mga dos hektar na akong saging karon Klasi-klasi nga mga seedling. Makatanong ko, tungod lang ani, mo nang kaingon ko nga dako yung katapang. First na mo nga kaning goal, no? Ang uh, kanad yung usability sa end users, sa farmers. Pero ang ato ah, yun mismo, gikan yun sa, sa roots bitaw sa ano, sa problema yun nga, nga atong itagal solusyon. My aspiration is that uh, Davao region would be a center or a hub for innovation. Yung grassroots innovations kasi, uh, importante sa atin na yung mga tao mismo sa baba, sa komunidad, ang nakakakita ng mga solusyon dun sa community mismo. No? Uh, our researchers in the academy, to be more relevant, they have to go down and see these realities and really identify the solutions, sustainable solutions that will bring, that will address these problems in the community.
this juncture, let us give our warmest welcome to each of our esteemed panel of speakers who will later impart their experiences on supporting grassroots innovations, both globally and in the Philippines. Before I introduce our first speaker, let me gently remind our speakers that you have 10 minutes to speak uh, on your presentation. Now let me introduce to you our first speaker. Our first speaker for today's panel discussion will discuss the topic on grassroots innovation, the global experience. Our speaker is an Indian scholar in the area of grassroots innovations. She is the founder of the Honey Bee Network and consults with the UNDP Accelerator Labs. He retired as a full-time professor at the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, in 2017, where he served for about 36 years. I had the honor and privilege to meet Dr. Our speaker in India in one of the meetings organized by UNSCAP. And that's when we hatched the idea for the Grassroots Innovation for Inclusive Development Program for the Philippines. He held an executive vice chair position at the National Innovation Foundation, where he is a member of its governing board now. He's also a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science. He was awarded the Padma Sri in the in year 2004 for his contributions to management education. Everyone, let us give a virtual clap for the founder of the Honeybee Network India, Dr. Anil Kumar Gupta. Thank you very much. Good morning to everybody. I'm very happy to be here with you all today to discuss how this movement started 33 years ago uh, when the word innovation was not as popular as it is now. And obviously, during the journey, we have learned a lot. We have also unlearned a lot. So Honeybee Network, essentially, when a nameless, faceless person, someone who nobody knows, comes in contact with the network and gets an identity. In my book in 2016, I have said that these are the minds on the margin, but these are not marginal minds. So we should not underestimate the power of these creative people to solve problems through their own genius. Now, what are these people actually? They're oddballs. As you can see in this one, this one is moving in a different direction. These are oddballs who see the world differently. And what does Honeybee Network do? It gives voice, it gives visibility, and it gives velocity to the creative and innovative people in formal and informal sector. Now, what, the, what is the philosophy of Honeybee Network? Cross-pollination of ideas. You know, just like honeybees do cross-pollination of flowers, we do cross-pollination of ideas from one community to another. Just now we saw the film which Anthony showed as to how people are trying to learn from the corn sheller, from the stove maker. They overcome anonymity. You could see the name of each and every innovator. We should protect their intellectual property right. Sharing back what we learn from them in local language with them. I know Philippines has very large number of languages and therefore it requires, it makes us obligated to make sure that whatever we learn from people goes back to them, not only what we learn from them, but from others also what we learn. So one person may share one innovation, but in return may get hundred innovations. And that will be a reciprocity which will enrich each innovator. That will incentivize them to share more knowledge. And if there's any value generated from that, to commercialization or otherwise, a fair and just share of benefit must accrue to the people who provided knowledge. These are the principles that we have. I would not take more time in defining because Anthony defined them well. Grassroots innovations are creative solutions by the communities themselves without any outside help. Whereas innovation for grassroots are different from innovation from grassroots. Sometimes, and this is important to notice, that sometimes traditional knowledge of one place or community becomes an innovation for another community. So we should not uh, only, we should not ignore the traditional knowledge of the communities because sometimes they can provide very valuable uh, links. So when we have to define an innovation, look at four dimensions. Three dimensions are material, method, and application. Each one of them can be dichotomized into old, new, old, new, old, new. And fourth dimension is delivery system, which could be old or new. 
at least one of the four should be new to call it innovation, either a new material or new method, new application, new delivery system, or all the four, or at least one of them. And uh, what do we do? What is the kind of value chain that we have tried to build? Scouting and documentation. <clears throat> Validation and value addition. You know, it's very important sometimes that claims that innovators make have to be validated because tomorrow a lot of people will go by the word that, do, that the Department of Science and Technology says, the Ministry of Science and Technology says, or uh, the UNDP Exhibition Lab says, or the Honeybee Network certifies. So therefore, people should have trust that anything that we have approved or recommended or at least uh, just recommended for the community adoption is valid and we may sometimes add validation, value addition also. Respect, recognition, and reward. Uh, rewards can be monetary or non-monetary. So in fact, just a citation sometimes goes a long way in boosting their confidence. Intellectual property protection, but also promotion of DIY solution, do-it-yourself solution, open source. Providing risk capital. We will have to provide risk capital, just as microfinance was for goods and services for which market exists. Micro venture finance is for goods and services for which market does not yet exist. So please remember that we need to provide risk capital, micro venture innovation fund to give grants, loans, equity, and combination thereof. We need to do larger scale trials for adaptive design changes. And of course, dissemination of database development and policy modulation. Policy is very important. I will come to that towards later as to how we can convert micro level innovations, grassroots level innovations into major national level policy changes. How do we search? We, uh, I mean, what Philippines does is select like by is something interesting, very creative, very innovative. Similarly, we do walk through the villages, cities for a week or 10 days, stay there. In summer, we go to hot places. Winter, we go to cold places. There's a concept of voluntary suffering which is very important to develop empathetic relationship. Students can search during summer or winter vacation or during COVID-19 when they are at home, please give them an assignment. And can you imagine the university is a partner in this program today and with thousands of students, you will get thousands of ideas, both from elders, from community and from the student themselves. Challenge and award competition in fairs, uh, assignment to the school uh, students and college students. So they must search, they must spread, they must celebrate innovations and sense the unmet need. We should also ask the students to identify the unmet needs of the elders, unmet need of the community, unmet need of the uh, local uh, innovators, local mechanics, and underutilized resources. These two will trigger more innovation by the students, by the people later on. And of course, we can also help innovators searching each other. So we do these walks in different parts of the country, in different ecosystems. And there are four teachers from whom we are trying to learn. Teacher within us, teacher around us, teacher in the nature, and teacher among common people. All the four teachers are teaching us. And therefore, we must be attentive. And we must pay attention that the learning walks can be very powerful. Show the Afra can be very powerful means of learning. Now, what do you do after you have scouted the innovation? This is the golden triangle, which Gyan, Grassroots Innovation Augmentation Network, the partner institution with UNDP. Uh, Acceleration Lab has practiced since 1997. 1993, we set up Srashti, 1997, we set up Gyan, and in 2000, we set up National Innovation Foundation. So there are three vectors, innovation, investment, enterprise. Investment, not just financial, but also material, also intellectual. Enterprise, not just economic, but also social, cultural, and ecological. And similarly, innovations from formal and informal sector. And this transaction cost of making them meet is very high. That's where the platform of innovation will come into play. That's where I'm hoping that Honeybee Network will be set up in Philippines too, to reduce these transaction costs. We will have clubs in every school and college of Philippines, which will try to do this search, spread, and celebration of innovation and sensing the unmet needs and underutilized resources. Every club will do that. Now let us look at one of the examples, very simple example, but very meaningful example for physically challenged people. If there is a wheelchair person, and that person has to go far. You can imagine that if they don't uh, can't afford car or can't afford a person to put him in the vehicle, what will you do? Look at what Jignesh Bhai has done. Jignesh has modified and designed a carrier for wheelchair, which he can drive now sitting on the wheelchair. Now he can go to 30, 50, 100 kilometers, doesn't matter. 
this is the power of creativity it gives wings to the imagination of people who otherwise might be constrained now and look at another example this little girl at that time she was in class 8 shalini she thought that her grandfather was not able to use walker uh, on the steps she just wrote two lines can the step have adjustable leg and now this time when you go up the legs become shorter when you come down the legs become taller such a walker did not exist anywhere in the world neither in europe nor in usa for that matter so she has developed a universal design and it has been licensed to a company she gets royalty and the interesting example and i would like to plead that please don't ignore children children can be very creative Kulsum, class 5, Tarun, class 10, independently sent us an idea. Many times when we are sitting, we are not having a right posture. So they said there must be a pressure sensor on the back or a sensor in the front of the camera, uh, in the computer screen. And if you're not sitting proper, a message will come, sit properly, I will not let you do work. Or chair will start singing till you become properly, you're sitting, your posture becomes correct. Now we all suffer from lower back pain. because and we don't do anything we have not done anything children have identified the problem that we have so we must build the ecosystem which begins from children to bigger children elderly children students farmers mechanics artisans and we must overcome six kinds of exclusion special exclusion sectoral exclusion seasonal exclusion social segment gender exclusion skill and knowledge based exclusion and of course sometimes the rules and regulations are such that lead to exclusion all of that now what kind of inclusive innovation ecosystem that can build we can have partnership with pro bono ipr firms science and technology institutions in public private and civil society commercial and non commercial diffusion networks educational institutions and so on now partnerships are crux of the matter honey bee network couldn't have done what it did without partnership no scientists in public sector or private sector lab charged for their time when we did the validation studies no ipr firm charged us for their time we could get in 400 dollars 500 dollars a patent whereas it would have cost about 2000 dollars otherwise within nation and internationally about 10000 dollars we didn't pay to the international patent attorneys either because they thought they will do a good job a great service to the cause of grassroots innovations because such a for, for a long time nobody thought iprs could be used by the poor but the resource in which poor people are rich is their mind if that is leveraged we can transform the society a change not monitored is a change not desired so we must look at how much how many innovation did we upload and how many did we download we are downloading a lot we are uploading less so leaders who care who want to develop a caring sharing and daring society must look at some of the ratios some of the indicators download to upload ratio is one seek searching or seeking to spreading ratio we have collected lot of innovations how many did we diffuse to among how many and in what ways did we diffuse scouting to validation ratio or validation number of lessons which are there in the textbooks of the school and school children and college textbooks very few lessons are found of the innovator that we saw today in in the beginning of the session these examples need to be showcased and children should feel inspired that if ordinary people can do so much then why can't we with much better endowment and education do more things so there are a lot of good open source databases that we have we have a database called as techpedia.in which has data which has engineering projects by 200000 students of our country you may not find the projects of mit and stanford at one place but you will find about 550000 students mind has been mapped similarly we created a, a database of abundant us patents techpedia.in/patent or yan.org/patent.php about 0.9 million abundant patents for free use anybody can use anywhere in philippines you can use this database without any registration without any permission from me you can just use it polytechnic student database farmers innovation database sachi.org all these databases are open source which can be used so please let me conclude by saying we need to set up honey bee network clubs in every institution uh, public private educational or otherwise which will do the searching of the innovation spreading of the innovation and celebrating the innovation inviting innovation to the classroom to the meeting rooms to the conferences and of course sense and benchmark the un unmet needs and so on we have been of course there are a large number of countries where where request for the products and uh, solutions developed by indian innovators have come i'm sure the same thing will happen to philippines uh, milking machine went to philippines uganda ethiopia from peru 
and large number of countries have sent requests. How did it happen? Because there's a hunger for grassroots innovations around the world. And many times common people are facing the same problem in Philippines or in India. And therefore we can have G2G model. We have B2B model, you have B2C model. We should have G2G model, grassroots to global. It will reverse the globalization. Globalization meant large corporations selling things to small people. We are saying, no, we will create market for the things that produce, are produced by these small people. So COVID-19, innovations uh, there are many where people who did not have a smartphone children who did not have smartphones and did not have internet access how did they get online education through cable tv through loudspeakers through conference calls large number of innovations have been done by the people i found this innovation very interesting where abaka and bar masks have been made these are made from the local materials local fibers and i i thought this was very creative because this is the way we generate employment this is the way we convert a crisis into an opportunity and i am very happy and i'm sure there are many such opportunities that will arise through our expansion of the network so let me conclude by saying what are the program means grassroots innovation for inclusive development program may support all the steps of the GRE value chain that I mentioned. We need to, we can create a GYAN, Philippines GYAN, or we can create a National Innovation Augmentation Foundation, which will provide support to not just 11 zone, zone 11, but all the zones of Philippines, they should provide support. We should help policymakers to set a standard to promote and protect GRI. We should have fast track testing, validation and regulatory approval process. We should have hassle-free funding for this approval. We should create multimedia, multi-language databases because there are so many languages in the Philippines. Everybody wants to learn in their own mother tongue. If you don't have, and many people are not literate, they need multimedia, multi-language. They can see a video and then understand. We should have national grind corps, national grind corps, where which will vol, which will mobilize the volunteers from every school and college. We should create handshake between medical council, industrial research council, agriculture research council, design council with uh, national innovation augmentation foundation of Philippines or for that matter, Philippines can. Last, call to action. What do I aspire? My aspiration, as Anthony mentioned, his aspiration. I want to send Anthony mention my aspiration when you came to Ahmedabad and you saw the exhibition of the innovations in the conference. We want that there should be a global community of innovations and therefore there should be a honeybee network in Philippines. We can have an MOU with the most, with the ministry or with the uh, grind program and Gyan representing Honeybee Network can sign this agreement so that we will share the database. All our databases, databases are yours. So you can start using them from tomorrow and uh, from today, in fact, because they're all available to you. So Honeybee Network started in 87, 88, Sashti 93, Gyan 97, and I have 2000. Creativity counts, knowledge matters, innovations transform and incentives inspire, but not just individual incentives, also collective incentive, not just material incentive, but also non-material. Thank you so Thank much, you. Uh, Dr. Gupta, for that insightful presentation. I hope everyone will uh, keep in mind the first statement of Professor Gupta, minds in the margins are not marginal minds. So moving on, to discuss our next topic on the grassroots innovation for inclusive development program, let me introduce to you our next speaker. She graduated with a degree of Bachelor of Science in Chemistry at the Western Mindanao State University, Magna Cum Laude. She completed her Master of Science in Environmental Engineering degree at the Asian Institute of Technology in Bangkok, Thailand. She subscribes to the idea that innovation is what we need to stay relevant, especially that the world keeps on evolving. She also believes that the strength of the country lies in the ingenuity of its people, coupled with the vast and diverse resources in the regions. Through her leadership, the Grassroots Innovation for Inclusive Development Program of the OST was conceptualized. Let us all welcome with a big, Virtual round of applause as Under Secretary for Regional Operations, the Department of Science and Technology, Under Secretary Brenda Nazareth Manzano. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tony, uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, Professor Gupta, I took note of your call of action and we're going to um, <clears throat> review it. 
Okay, is my slide okay and my audio okay? Yes, we can we can listen to you. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. I think yes. I think everybody with the background given earlier, I think everybody will believe or will agree with me that innovations are not only developed in the laboratories by the scientists, researchers, and engineers through the usual R&D process. But anyone who's imbued with creativity can also develop innovations, even those who have not gone to school or those who, although they've gone to school, but did not have formal training on the conduct of research and development. Um, Filipinos are inherently creative. And that innate creativity helps us to think of ways on how we can respond to the problems and challenges we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives. <clears throat> and I should say that this grassroots innovation really can steer economic uh, growth and development. One a good example of this is a story, a success story of um, the Villa Consuelo community in Haro Leyte. This uh, barangay, the Villa Consuelo, is located seven kilometers from the town proper of Halo, Haro Leyte. And it used to be a poor farming village that is sanctuary to communist rebels. People dreaded to go to this barangay. But with the interventions from different government agencies such as DOSD and other organizations, the once poor village a leading, is now a leading site for farm tourism in Eastern Visayas. Among others, the community is engaged in high value vegetable crop production, one of which is tomato. It, uh, and this is where they had the grassroots innovations. Without knowing the exact science behind it, they started propagating tomato plant from cuttings. This innovation was born out of the need to make their tomato plants more resilient because you know, Haro Leyte is a typhoon prone area and they need to trim their tomato plants so that the branches will grow horizontal rather than vertical. At first, they were just throwing the, 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 the cuttings. Later, they tried planting the cuttings and were successful at doing so. This innovation resulted in savings and more income to the farmers in the village. Before the, uh, the barangay, uh, before the barangay used to buy tomato seeds for around 600 to 1,000 pesos per kilo. It would then take them 80 to 90 days before they can harvest uh, good quality tomatoes. But with the innovation, they were able to save money because they do not have to always buy tomato seeds. It also only takes them less than a month for the planted cuttings to bear fruits. Another example of grassroots innovation that has become commercially available is the bamboo bikes or the bam bike. The bam builders or those who handmade bamboo bikes come from Dawad Kalinga, Kalinga a Philippine-based community development organization for the poor and working to bring an end to poverty. Born from the idea of using sustainable materials instead of metal alloys in the production of bicycles, the innovation has caught the attention of many. Now, BAM bike has become one of the sought after bicycle brands in the country. So you see, looking at this, I see great challenge and opportunity for us. The challenge is understanding the science behind grassroots innovation. And the opportunity is using science to scale up and package grassroots innovation for adoption. 
The sad reality though is grassroots innovation is yet to be recognized and supported on the national level. As, um, as of yet, we do not have policies in place to help the producers of these grassroots innovations so they can bring their innovations to market. Thus, the benefits and potential contributions of grassroots innovation to economic development are not yet fully explored and maximized. Also to this end, the Department of Science and Technology has conceptualized the grassroots innovations for inclusive development or uh, the GRIND framework plan, which is supportive of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, Philippine Development Plan for 2017 to 2022, and even the in Philippine Innovation Act. The participation of and collaboration among the government civil society organizations, academe, and industry sectors is central to the operationalization of the plan. GRIND really is aimed at promoting inclusive growth and reducing poverty and inequality through the development of the grassroots innovation ecosystem. As uh, shown in this slide, uh, the DOST's grind uh, features the four L's framework, uh, thanks to the team of uh, Dr. Sales for conceptualizing this. No? The four L's framework um, are uh, learning, leveraging, linking, and le legitimizing. These four L's will also be the major component activities of the Grind program, learning and identification of GIs. We will also be, this also where you set the vision, the targets and the strategies to achieve. Leveraging means uh, provision of assistance on how to commercialize the grassroots innovations and even finding the science behind the innovation. Linking is developing and strengthening the network of advocates and experts of the marginalized uh, sector, sharing of facilities, knowledge and expertise, and even databasing of GIs, their resources and expertise. And finally, the fourth L is legitimizing, is this is focused on crafting policies institutionalization of programs, projects, and activities, and more importantly, the provision of funds and investments to improve and sustain the GI um, ecosystem. So what, we, what have we accomplished? So far, um, we successfully launched the DOST grants um, framework plan last July 20, 2019. And uh, the GRIND program, as uh, already mentioned earlier, is being pilot tested in the Davao region. And uh, if you look at the four L's under the learning component, this was also um, mentioned earlier by uh, Dr. Sales and also in his uh, video, they did already the Salik Lakbay uh, Solutions Mapping Adventure uh, in three provinces in the Bau region. For the leveraging component, the DOST 11 team conducted testing of identified grassroots innovations for possible food product commercialization. The team is also exploring the possible funding of weaving facility and materials through grassroots innovation funds, as well as capacity building of grassroots innovators. For the linking component, the team employs the Pentahelix collaboration approach to help improve the GI ecosystem in the region. We have even involved international organizations such as UNESCO and UNDP. And um, for the legitim the, the last L to legitimize it, the OST 11 presented a policy paper during the regional research, development, and innovation coordinating uh, committee uh, meeting, the third quarter meeting in, in last September 
14, 2020, seeking for approval and an adoption of the grassroots innovation framework in the Vau region. Uh, during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have also seen how grassroots innovations um, helped our people protect themselves from the virus and cope with the new normal. For, for example, uh, the regional office in the Vau region was, was able to record, among others, the following GIs. This was also shown earlier, some of these were shown earlier. The food, food operated hand washing kiosk, the disinfectant, the emergency food products, such as squid diet or uh, dried shrimp and tuna in oil, immunity booster products made from fruits and leaves of the breadfruit plant and some face masks as well. We have seen how this pandemic unveiled the Filipino discarte system, which is an innate capacity to learn and adapt ideas to local needs. So what are our ways forward? BOSD believes that there really is great potential for our GI ecosystem. Filipinos have rich heritage, and our country is endowed with um, great natural resources. We believe that with these rich, rich uh, resources, our ancestors and even the generations of today must have come up with grassroots innovations that have great potential for commercialization. Thus, as a way forward, uh, very recently, the DOSD Execom has just approved a 6.5 million peso grant uh, grind project, which will be implemented by DOSD 11 in cooperation with UNESCO and UNDP. And this will be guided by the four L's framework of the project will cover GIs on heirloom, food recipes, endangered crafts, ethno botanicals and innovation addressing health hazards. With the successful implementation of grind program in the Vau region, we are convinced that we can maximize the gains of the program if we are to implement this in all regions of the country. Thus, we will push for the crafting of guidelines for a nationwide implementation of GRIND based on the learnings and experiences of DOSD 11 in pilot region. And while we are at it, we will intensify further the implementation and promote the adoption of GRIND's four L's to develop and strengthen the GI ecosystem in the country. <clears throat> While there may be a lot of GIs in the country, only a few are brought to the market. Thus, as I've mentioned earlier, the benefits and potential contributions of these GIs to economic develop development are not fully explored and maximized. For this reason, we see the need for capability building of stakeholders to effectively translate GIs into a package of technologies that are ready for adoption. For instance, we can capacitate the state colleges and universities and even the private sector. So they will be able to identify these grassroots innovators and perhaps help these innovators understand the science behind the GIs and eventually help them scale up their innovations and package them into adoption ready technologies. This way, we will be able to help grassroots innovators penetrate the mainstream market. Also, as a support to the grassroots innovators, we will also synergize GRIND with other DOST programs to communities, such as the community empowerment through science and technology. There is also a need to institutionalize policies to mainstream grassroots innovations. Needless to say, we need policies to ensure the sustainability of our efforts in mainstreaming GIs. 
with policies in place, it would be easier for us to get the concerned stakeholders to work towards our goal of developing the GI ecosystem in our country. We also believe that promotion is a key element in communicating the importance of grassroots innovation. Thus, we will never tire from promoting and bringing our message across. And that message is that there is great promise in GI. All we need is to harness them, study and package them into ready to adapt innovations and bring them to market. This is my last slide. I believe that our GI ecosystem or our grassroots innovation ecosystem is just one eye away from contributing to the global innovation index. And that one eye is integration. Following our four L's framework and using science, we need to integrate grassroots innovation to the mainstream innovation ecosystem so we can make the most out of them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Undersecretary uh, Brenda Nazareth Monsano for uh, presenting to us the milestones that were gained so far in the grind program and building on the experiences of the Filia Consuelo uh, community in Haro Leite. We will wait for the programs grind breaking contributions to inclusive and sustainable development goals. Now at this point, We'd like to introduce to you our last, but definitely not the least presenter for today's webinar, who will discuss the topic on bridging grassroots innovators and innovation to market. She's the executive director of Cubo, the Philippines National Innovation Hub, which she launched in 2016. Cubo is a public-private initiative geared to support and accelerate the growth of the Filipino tech startup ecosystem. At Cubo, she advises startups and leads overall program activities, collaborating closely with ecosystem partners. She previously served as head of growth and strategy at Idea Space, the Philippines' largest private startup accelerator. She obtained her Bachelor of Science in Material Science and Engineering with a double major in business administration at Carnegie Mellon University. She's a Filipina millennial that advocates for spurring innovation and technopreneurship as an engine for driving economic growth and competitiveness in emerging economies. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Ms. Katrina Chan. Good morning. Ms. Chan, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Dr. Salas, for the introduction, and good morning, everybody. Um, allow me to share my screen. Um, can everyone see this? Can everyone see the slides? Yes, we're good. Great. Um, so again, thank you so much for inviting me to this forum on grassroots innovation. Again, as mentioned in the introduction, I am Kat Chan and I'm the executive director of Kubo Innovation Hub. Um, and I guess my talk today would be trying to capture sort of bridging grassroots innovations um, and innovators to market sort of from the lens of my experiences from the tech startup space, I guess uh, maybe a niche form of grassroots innovation, so to speak. Um, so I guess there's an, a universal recognition, right? That innovations or the real innovations that are going to be coming up are going to be coming from the developing and developing countries such as the Philippines, right? Um, and many other places that look like us, more like us than the already developed and industrialized nations. And even as early as 2005, when you look at incubators, um, for example, or enabling organizations for innovation, they've, we've, the developing countries have already overtaken, right? The developed nations in terms of the pace and the growth of, um, I guess, new innovations that are coming in. So, and maybe I'll step back a sec and like sort of what are incubators, right? And what are the roles of hubs in the innovation ecosystem? 
well, I guess if you think about an innovation, right? Like it's not it's not merely like an a piece of IP or an invention or you know like your your smartphone, right? Which maybe many would consider to be one of the biggest sort of groundbreaking or shifting um, innovations, quote unquote, right? In in today's in today, right? Was is actually a product of a lot of inventions and more importantly, like these inventions kind of being brought to market. And that's really the role that business incubators and accelerators play in kind of helping a particular innovator or founder um, put together, right? Like a suite of services and other elements that really help the innovation launch to market. And on top of that, we actually think of um, incubators also as playing the role of hubs in an ecosystem. So it requires that density not, and you know, availability of capital, of networks, of customers, right? To be able to fully launch and really create impact for your innovation. So as I was saying, like going from an entrepreneur all the way to the market, to the impact, right? That you're trying to seek has so many components to it, right? That I, you know, I won't mention, but are sort of on the slide, right? So this enabling environment, this support system is key to being able to sort of really launch um, any innovation really. And that's what, what that's important to build in order to help grassroots innovation also, or any innovation succeed. So even when you're looking at tech startups, for example, so I, I, I put in a couple of fun facts here in the slide, but when TechCrunch examined our billion dollar unicorn startups, you might say these are the super success stories, right? Your average founder was 34 years old, but I think the, the more important thing is many of them had previous startup experience, more than three fourths of them did, and over 90% had you know, some kind of technical or product knowledge, right? And is it possible now to think about, you know, creating these support systems that would allow many innovators, right, to sort of leapfrog or create that experience um, and accelerate the growth of their innovation and essentially bring these to market? So that's really the question that in incubators are trying to answer. So when you think about the state of the innovation ecosystem in the Philippines in particular, all the signs are really, really good. Like um, essentially our rankings in many aspects have been growing like really in, in the last, just in the last few years. Um, and the, the country in particular has gained top ranks in, you know, how we're able to, you know, our talent pool essentially, and also the types and the quality of tech that we're creating. In the startup space in particular, this is also true. So the Philippines is being recognized in you know, its potential and embedded capabilities and being able to really create a strong tech startup ecosystem. A lot of it has to do with, again, our talent and sort of the demographic dividends, right? A lots of you know, young people that are you know, not only willing to adopt solutions, but also you know, um, are you know, huge market, right? That, can both create and consume tech at an unprecedented rate. But I think what also makes places like the Philippines you know, unique and special is our ability to create high impact solutions that are you know, more about real world problems, so to speak, and not just, um, I don't know, photo filters, right? So, so similarly, our rankings in startup ecosystem kind of studies have been growing in the last few years and in particular you know in the world we are very competitive in terms of again our talent our talent pool our connectedness and even this concept of bang for buck right or being able to you know extract a lot of innovation from even for a small investment um, looking specifically at you know the covid landscape that of course we have to acknowledge um, you know, there, there was one study that said that Philippines was number seven best country in the world to invest in post COVID. Um, and from our own study with PwC, we saw that, um, you know, 20, as much as like 21%, if not even more startups are actually experiencing rapid growth during COVID. And what does this tell me? It's showing, what it's showing us is that our startups are actually responding to very real needs, right? In the, of, of people like um, 
in the country and sort of attacking like very real problems. So this is sort of just a quick overview of where we are now. It's still a small ecosystem, but definitely growing. And the, the enabling infrastructure, at least for the tech startup side, is showing rapid change, right? So it's it's quite it was quite inspiring for me to hear some of the efforts of the OST and you know, in terms of seeing how this can translate to the grassroots. But in the tech startup space, we're definitely seeing, you know, from technology business incubators in the school, in the educational institutions and HEIs. And also with you know the passage of the Philippine Innovation Act, as well as the Innovative Startup Act, right? Like support both at the institutional level and also at the community level for startups. So how do like um so I guess I wanna quickly, so bef um before I move on, I wanna quickly give Kubo as our a case study, right, for how we've seen this bridging to market as it applies to the tech startup space. So Kubo actually stands for the Baha'i Kubo. So we're, we, it's all about bayanihan and teamwork, right? And we're actually a product of that also. So it's a collaboration among idea space, JP Morgan, and then from the public sector, of course, the OSD as well as the DTI. And we work with startups across stages as well as across sectors. Um, our whole mantra with the Kubo, right, is again, bayanihan and Filipino startups changing the world, but we can create, right, the solutions that will change the world in the Philippines, right? And our founders have the know-how and the ability to be able to scale and create innovation. So our approach to this is through our three core actions. The first that well, the first thing that we believe is super important is that we need to grow the startup community. There needs to be density, there needs to be enough awareness, enough people trying things out, right? To really make an ecosystem that's sustainable. The second is to develop our Philippine startups. So, you know, starting up and bringing out a new innovation to the world is not easy. So they need as much development support as they can get. And our third, and our third pillar or core action is to collaborate with the ecosystem and make sure that it's beyond the innovator. There are pieces there that support the innovator when they're trying to bring their solutions to market. So just to quickly illustrate some of the programs that we have under these pillars, right? For Grow, for example, you know, we always have a lot of free networking events and food, right? We have road shows, we do lots of classes. So really it's about make enticing people to, you know, work on their innovations, know that there's community and network there and um, that, you know, is supportive of this uh, movement. In under our develop pillar, you know, we have consultations with experts, we have workshops, we even, you know, create opportunities to showcase our Filipino startups through delegations. And we have long for programs too, like incubation that really kind of help guide startups through the process. And then when you look at our collaborate pillar, these are, you know, our efforts around, you know, mapping and reports, right, around what are the sort of existing infrastructure that's out there, who's in the community, right? We also launched competitions that I think was mentioned earlier. So, you know, again, creating excitement, um, working with different stakeholders and identifying where their biggest needs, right? We also, we also do programs like the Philippine Startup Week. So this is also in collaboration with the DOSD, DTI, and DICT. We're doing it again this year, right? Um, so please do join that. And, um, and also activities like the TBI 4.0. So not just developing the startups themselves, but also you know, developing other incubators throughout the country right, that are going to create that foundation. So of course, even like while we've, you know, we've been really trying hard in all of these things, right? There's still a lot of challenges, even in the tech startup space, right? Where it's relatively more mature. Raising capital is still um, incredibly difficult, right? Um, you know, retaining talent and all, all of these things, right? Still exist within the Philippine startup ecosystem. So, you know, for the grassroots, right? What can, what can we learn and you know, how do we move forward, right? So I like this quote, it's like in any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing, the next best thing is the wrong thing, and the worst thing you can do is nothing. So, you know, essentially I think with tech startups and with grassroots innovation, we just need to keep trying and experimenting and supporting, right, this whole innovation process and the people that are behind it. And by that, I want, I mean that, you know, Inevitably, like in tech startups, right, nine out of 10 of them fail. It's going to be the same, most likely, for grassroots innovation. We have this thing, like maybe called survivor bias, right, where the ones that do really great like, are the ones you remember. But for everyone that 
you know, creates huge impact and scales up, there, there are going to be, you know, hundreds, if not thousands, right, of people that are attempting this and maybe don't make it, right? But the important thing, if we want grassroots innovation to be a meaningful part of how we build innovation in the future, is that we try, right? We invest, we support that entire process, right? And not just, you know, have set expectations for what will come out. And I think that's always the beauty of innovation is that we don't know um, where it can lead, but that the potential and the impact is incredible. And that's the same, you know, especially when you face time of crisis like COVID-19, right? Who saw this coming? No one did, but it's here and we need to support, right? That entire process that helps us build stronger from this. So I guess last couple of slides, right? Like I just wanna recap some of the challenges, gaps and opportunities that I see. So challenges, first, I mentioned this earlier, there's really a huge sort of risk and failure aversion. Like we are, we try too hard, I think, as um, enablers to see into the future and make the right investments and bets, right? But, um, and that's really restricted the amount of capital that you know goes into innovations. And I, I'm glad to see that it's beginning to change. That's also led to funding for grassroots innovations being severely limited, right? And again, there's this, there's really the skills gap between just having science maybe or having know-how and building a business or something that really scales and can sustain itself. So in terms of gaps, right? Um, we, we are seeing lots of improvements already in a lot of the indices, but you know, a lot of these targets do not capture grassroots innovations ex explicitly, and that is quite challenging also to do, but it is something that we should be looking at and considering in the broader innovation ecosystem. Um, there's also really, you know, there are some great efforts that are already going on, but there's not enough sort of reach or awareness perhaps in a lot of these. And this was also a challenge that we encountered in the startup space. So to overcome these, like where do I see opportunities? Well, first of all, like, again, if we're considering the 700 startups to leapfrog development to really create like an innovation nation, so to speak, we need an inclusive approach, right? That, and this does include community-led grassroots innovation. We also need to support the enablers, right? So it's not just the specific individual innovator, but that whole environment that he or she operates in that is again, conducive and supportive of these innovations taking root and gaining scale. Because at day one, no innovator can compete with the big guys or what the conventional approaches are. And you do need to sort of subsidize or handhold that to some at some level, right? Um, and I think I've mentioned this a few times, but we really just need to be doing more experiments. We need to be supporting, you know, and investing in like, high risk projects, things that we don't know if or if whether or not they'll work out, right? But we need to support that whole process. And last but not the least is, again, when you think about grassroots, thinking about the designer versus the user-led innovation, right? So I'd like to conclude with that, right? So this is really the, at the heart of grassroots innovation is, you know, seeing like what we, what might we be able to achieve, right? If we didn't not only tap, right, our sort of, talent pool in among designers and sort of create co-creation and co-creation, right? But really started supporting and digging into what our grassroots innovators can do. Um, this, is, this is a sentiment that's been expressed a few times, but essentially, you know, at the grassroots is where they know where the problems are. And this is one of my favorite quotes, right? From Yuri Levin, the founder of Waze fall in love with a problem, not the solution. So there's, you know, there are many, many solutions to the, a particular problem and we might, you know, it's hard to know, right? Like which is the right one without running in enough experiments. But if we fall in love with a problem and by definition our grassroots, innova grassroots innovators are deeply embedded in that problem, right? There's such a, huge potential for them to really create meaningful solutions that directly tackle those problems. And that's really why our grassroots innovations need support. So with that, thank you so much for listening to my presentation and I'm looking forward to our discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina, wonderful presentation. We took note of the, of Cubo's strategies to help startups grow, develop, collaborate. And this is, these are actually aligned with the 
or else uh, framework of the grassroots innovation for inclusive development program of the DOST. At this point, let us proceed to the next part of our webinar, the open discussion. We have three reactors from three sectors who will clarify, ask questions, and discuss insights in the presentations of any of the speakers. These reactors are from the academy, the civil society, and the public sector. After each discussion from each reactor, we will later be entertaining questions from the audience. In the interest of time, let me remind our reactors that you have five minutes to weigh in, clarify, ask questions, and discuss insights and the presentations on any of the speakers. Now let me introduce to you our first reactor who will represent the academic and technology sector. Our reactor, first reactor, is a professor at the Electrical and Electronics Engineering Institute of the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Director of the UP System Technology Transfer and Business Development Office, and the program leader of the Upscale Innovation Hub. He was Vice Chancellor for Research and Development of UP Diliman from 2006 to 2011, during which he established Techno Transfer Office. He holds an MS and PhD electrical engineering degrees from Purdue University and a BS electrical engineering degree from UP Diliman. Let us all welcome Dr. Luis Sison. Dr. Sison, right, you thank have the you. floor. Uh, all right, thank you, Dr. Tony. How's my, how's my audio? It's good. We can hear you clearly. Hello. All right. We can. Okay. Uh, so thanks again to Dr. Anil Gupta for sharing a lot of um, uh, good insights. And uh, it's, it's also good to hear from uh, Yusik Brenda and uh, our uh, collaborators in the, uh, the technopreneurship space, uh, CAT. Uh, so yes, all of those, uh, I'd like to, you know, just, uh, do a plus one on all the initiatives laid out so far. And, uh, maybe as part of the academe, I can, uh, I can, uh, voice my support and also, uh, provide some details on how, uh, we in the, in UP, as well as our university network would be able to support all of these, uh, uh, initiatives. Okay, um, so the, the first off, uh, I'd like to add to what Kat said about the the, the TBI work. So uh, with DOST support, uh, we are part of uh, uh, the Hear It network of uh, incubators. Uh, and there's a, a similar network uh, for the uh, uh, agricultural space under Picard. So all in all, there are several dozen. I, th I think there are by now over 50 uh, uh, incubators, uh, mostly in the in the academe as well as in the and some in the private sector. Uh, so so that network is is available uh, uh, to the the honeybee and the, the grind uh, uh, networks. And uh, the challenge usually in, in finding collaborators is figuring out who to talk to. <laughs> uh, sometimes we tend to be very uh, bureaucratic uh, in the academe and, and having a single office that uh, you know grassroots innovators can reach out to i think that would be a a, a great enabling factor so just uh drop by uh, any of our uh, the incubators or uh, also our knowledge centers in, in universities and we will be able to to hook you guys up so so that's the first one on that network uh, where we can uh contribute uh the, the second one uh is more a bit more academic, uh, and that is our technopreneurship uh, 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 curriculum. Uh, so, uh, with, with in addition to the DOST, with also the support of, of CHED, uh, we have uh, uh, set up uh, across the country what we call the Tech 101 or the technopreneurship uh, curriculum uh, pr programs. Uh, and, and so, we have uh, spent the last couple of years. Uh, in, in partnership with which in providing training uh, to faculty around the country so that they can set up uh, these uh, these courses and and these are logical 
collaboration points. No? You, ha you have these students who are learning about entrepreneurship. And if we hook them up to, to the Honeybee and, and the Grind Networks uh, uh, and, and expose them to community needs, uh, then hopefully the wheels will start spinning uh, and, and we'll be able, the, the students and the faculty will be able to provide technology support to, to the um, to, to our community uh, and grassroots innovators. Uh, and related to that, we also have a grass, uh, the HEED uh, class in, in UP, Humanitarian Engineering, Entrepreneurship and Design. Uh, and it's a multidisciplinary effort also. Uh, and that is specifically the community uh, focused uh, part of, of the technopreneurship uh, curriculum. Uh, and finally, we're, we're, uh, we hope to collaborate with you uh, through our Uplift program in social entrepreneurship that's being launched by, by Upscale. So uh, NGOs and communities uh, and uh, together with our incubator uh, a program, uh, we, we hope we'll be able to launch a few more ventures together with our grassroots innovators. Uh, so I think uh, that that's a lot of things that uh, we can contribute to. I'm looking forward to all of the collaborations. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Louis. I had the privilege to work with uh, Dr. Sison under the Technology Business Incubation Program of Pika Star, no? uh, several years ago. And uh, we appreciate your, the information uh, provided on uh, how UP Diliman or the UP system can help our grassroots innovations in the country. Moving forward, let me introduce to you our second reactor who will represent the civil society sector. Our second reactor is currently the executive director of the Peace and Equity Foundation or PEF. It provides overall strategic leadership to PAF and is responsible for execute, executing PAF's five-year social enterprise development program as a strategy to promote inclusive growth through the creation of shared value among business, public, and community institutions. Prior to joining PAF, he served as Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director of institutions such as the Asia-Pacific Philanthropy Consortium the Miran Philippines Foundation, and the Philippine Business for Social Progress, where he gained expertise in corporate social responsibility, corporate sustainability, and stakeholder management. Please help me welcome Mr. Roberto Calimo. Uh, thank you, uh, and uh, good morning to my co-panelists. Uh, hearing from Dr. Sales, Professor Gupta, Yusek uh, Manzano and to Kat, I was able to, to get a glimpse of the various initiatives in, in so far as uh, grassroots initiatives are concerned. When I was invited to this session uh, with the title uh, uh, Grassroots Innovation in the Time of COVID, I was uh, looking at uh, various ways wherein uh, we can leverage innovation to help manage the COVID impact among the vulnerable sectors in terms of health, education, and livelihood. We all know that, uh, and from the presentations, uh, we, we are able to get uh, an idea about the definition of the grassroots innovation, the need for uh, risk capital from uh, Dr. Adil Gupta, and the need to reduce the cost of innovation the different uh, examples of application of uh, innovation among farmers in Mindanao and, uh, and, the, and the incubator project of program of Cubo. Uh, my, uh, my take on the presentation is uh, first to put some context in the light of the theme for today, looking for solutions using innovation to solve uh, problems even that, that existed even before the COVID. We all know that the Philippines has uh, 17 million poor uh, Filipinos and the uh, PIDS said that around 1.5 million Filipinos will become poor because of COVID. So more or less we have around 18 million Filipinos. 
And I think that is the objective of innovation. How can we ensure that these poor, vulnerable uh, Filipinos will make it in times of this pandemic in terms of their livelihood, education, and health? And uh, the PSA said that almost majority of the poor are located in the rural areas. They're mostly farmers and fishers. So I would look for technology that will enable them to improve livelihood, the health welfare, the health outcomes, and even education, which is impacted by COVID because of the distance learning. And uh, looking at uh, our innovation budget, uh, the R&D of the Philippines, it's only 0.2% of the GDP. We're the lowest in Asia, and we have not put a lot of investments in the agricultural sector. That's why the agricultural sector lagged behind. So that's, I think that's the context of this uh, grassroots innovation, ensuring that the vulnerable sector will make it in terms of livelihood, education, and health. And how do we propose to do that? I think it was mentioned in the definition that uh, grassroots innovation is looking from the eyes of the users, no? the, the poor, and finding solutions based on their own context. I think that's a, a good start because uh, we are now changing the context of innovation from Manila-centric to the communities uh, where solutions are needed. And... Uh, I think we have to make the innovation nearer to the poor because they are the source of the problem. And I believe there's, they're also the source of solution. We should change the mindset that the poor are just recipients of help. I think 17 million Filipinos is a good source of innovation. Innovation is a, is a way of the poor to survive. They have inferior resources, and they have to make do with what they have in order to survive for livelihood, for health, and education. And in order to do this, I think we need to build an ecosystem. I look at ecosystem differently. My ecosystem is there's a group that will help to organize and connect communities. That's one group, or we call them enablers. There's also a group of technical providers who can put science into the indigenous practices. And the third is the financing. 6.5 million will not make it. I looked at the Bayanihan 2 budget and I, I, I didn't see any R&D budget in the Bayanihan 2 uh, budget recently approved by Congress. So 6.5 million in Midana, I think is too, too small to, to enable widespread application. No? So how do we propose to do this? There was a mention, I, I, I wrote down the name. Oh, Mr. Ezra Tendero, uh, I think Ezra asked in the Q&A, what is the appetite of the donors in so far as failure of, of innovation is concerned? I think that's the key to innovation, to grassroots innovation. We should set up failure laboratories. As Scott mentioned, nine out of 10 will fail. So we, have to, we, we should not be afraid of failure, because that is the first step towards innovation, failure. So we have to set up failure laboratories on the ground, not in the very clean laboratories in Metro Manila. Like what we are doing in PF in a small scale, our laboratories are located in the Fisher Folks, in the areas where they're operating, in the mountains of Sultan Kudarat, mountains of Benguet. That is where the laboratory is, because that is where the solutions are. So I think failure lab, ecosystem, the change of mindset in the innovation and the context of inequality. I think those are my takeaway from the presentation this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kalingo, for properly contextualizing GIs in the COVID pandemic and beyond the COVID pandemic, considering poverty, agriculture, education, health and the other sectors impacted by the pandemic. And we like your concept of the failure labs. We will take that into consideration when we move forward with the implementation of the crime uh, program of the OSD. And now let me introduce the last but not the least reactor who will represent the public sector. 
She's the Dean of the Graduate School of Public and Development Management of the Development Academy of the Philippines. She headed the DAP GSPDM academic team during the first Senate hearing on Sustainable Development Goals, Innovation and Future Thinking, in which she presented the strategic foresight framework for the Philippines anchored on the SDGs. I'm happy to hear about the Future Thinking Initiative because this is uh, very much aligned to the Future Earth Program of the Philippines, being led by national scientist Lourdes Cruz, and under which I'm also involved in the implementation in Mindanao. Through her leadership, our last reactor and a series of invitations from the Senate Committee followed thereafter, giving GSPDM the leverage to participate committed to democratize future thinking in the country. She's the president and one of the founders of the Philippine Futures Thinking Society. She also teaches at the graduate level at various universities around the metro. Let us all welcome once again, Dr. Lizan Perante Kalina. Thank you, Dr. Anthony Sales, for that kind introduction. My a take from the presentation of uh, Dr. Anil Gukda, no, Yusek Brenda, and of course, Kat Shan, really is on, um, on innovations, no? innovations when it comes to socialization. Uh, socialization means really it's about um, talking to the people, no? uh, walking in the community, looking into um, what are the new things that we can innovate. And this is about uh, the Salik uh, Lakbay, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Sales. So that's one, um, one key factor. Another is uh, co-creation. So after socialization, uh, there should be knowledge co-creation. No? From that tacit knowledge, it must be converted into uh, explicit. No? Uh, this is already... Uh, about uh, a particular no, a particular innovation. And of course, another important thing is collaboration. When we collaborate, meaning to say, we really uh, engage all sectors in the society. Uh, coming from the public sector, I would say that governments alone can't do it. So we need to have this um, local government, LGU, NGA, academe, industry, and NGO linkages so that the said collaboration will really maximize the efforts of um, every stakeholders in the community. And um, with this uh, three factors, I think we'll be able to realize a regenerative and revitalized community wherein we can factor in uh, our culture, our values, and um, of course, the innovations led by our grassroots uh, innovators. And um, another thing is um, the important thing, no? because uh, government alone can't do it. And uh, from the public sector, all we can do really is to uh, provide funding and technical assistance. But at the end of the day, what matters most is uh, the people in the community. So what are we going to do? What we're going to do is now is to empower them. No? By empowering them, we need to change values. We need to change their mindsets that they have ownership in these innovations and that the local government units, you know, like in the community level, must acknowledge these innovations introduced by our local innovators. So there must be um, values. No? We have to incorporate values, education, and uh, the social entrepreneurship skills of our innovators. And um, this um, grassroots innovation um, program is really a welcome development, no? not only, of course, to solve uh, societal issues, but um, to develop communities. No? And that is really towards uh, a regenerative and resilient communities. Because right now, um, we, as mentioned by Dr. Sales, we are advocating and promoting futures thinking. And how do we use uh, futures thinking and uh, foresight as policy tools? No? We are uh, solving problems not only you know, uh, at the present time. So we have to go beyond. So what, uh, what do we want uh, for our community in the next 10 years, in the next five years? So we have that uh, kind of skill set um, in uh, in innovation, no? in uh, grassroots innovation, we can uh, further um, upgrade or build up the capacities of our uh, local 
innovators as well as in partnership with our policymakers. Because to sustain this, we really need to have policies. As mentioned by uh, ASEC Brenda, we need to have policies both at the local level and at the national level. So this is really towards national development. So I'm glad that we have this uh, gra grassroots um, innovation. And another thing, important thing is that uh, from the public sector and from the academia as well, we would like to incorporate this as another paradigm in public administration. So we will include this in our course syllabus. So thank you very much, Dr. Salas. Thank you, Dr. Kalina, very nice. Uh inputs and insights on socialization, co-creation, and collaboration. And we appreciate your thoughts on cultural sensitivity of the interventions that we provide to grassroots innovation, as well as anticipating the needs of our grassroots communities when we develop our programs for intervention. Now, let us entertain questions from our participants. Again, anyone who would like to ask questions, please write them down in our question and answer box. In the interest of time, you will only entertain max a maximum of five questions from the audience. Starting with, let me read. I think one of the challenges that we face, as well as the Philippine government's readiness, or is the Philippine government's readiness for these innovations? Our regulatory environment is not that ready for some innovations. What are your thoughts on this? It is from Leanne Kim Jane Lozanes. And uh, perhaps you can ask this from Under Secretary Brenda Nazaret Manzano. Uh, Dr. Tan, I fully agree. Um, it's difficult at this time. Even, even in the past, even with our uh, Innovation Startup Act, we're still finding it difficult to um, really um, <clears throat> Please go, please go on, I uh, just Okay, we'll, we'll get back to so you said Brenda, uh, maybe ask perhaps uh, the other panelists uh, to address this question. Hi, Dr. Maybe ask, sorry, uh, yes, please Hi, Dr. proceed. Salas. Yes, um, just I guess to quickly respond also on maybe the private sector perspective on this. Of, of I I do we do recognize that there are lots of efforts at the government level at the top level that are you know huge and will change the game for everyone right but even at the sort of more micro level of at least having these conversations with you know government officials stakeholders that are willing to listen to the challenges right and kind of try to address them even in let's say ways that don't scale in the startup community for example we've had. A lot of experiences of like, um, let's say a startup encountering a regulatory hurdle or a permit that they just couldn't get, right? Because the existing rules didn't make sense for the tech that they were building. And, you know, it's been so helpful just to have, you know, people sort of embedded in the system, quote unquote, that are willing to listen to you and say, hey, maybe this is how we need to be adjusting, like, or this is how we can help you get that permit so you can do your business, right? So. I think you know there is a lot of power also behind smaller incremental changes. Not to say that we're not working towards the big systemic change, but you know that there is a lot that can be done, and we shouldn't give up on it just because you know. So it takes like one conversation at a time and a better understanding of the needs of our communities and the people that we're trying to help. So I just wanted to kind of add that into the conversation too. Thank you, Katrina, for those inputs. Uh, well, I guess I can. Um speak for DOSD 11, we've been very agile in addressing the needs of our grassroots innovators in the region. Uh, and I guess it's an indication of our readiness for innovations at the regional level. Right after the passage of the Philippine Innovation Act, uh, we launched the grind program uh, to address the requirements of our innovators at the grassroots level. So moving on, 
A question for the panel, would you say that events such as the COVID-19 pandemic has changed our appetite for risk or failure in embracing innovation projects driven by societal need? Maybe uh, this is from Pritam Hiramun. I guess he's from, from India. Uh, may we ask? Hold on, I'm back. Yes, uh, you said Brenda. Sorry for that. Yes, please proceed, uh, Under Secretary. Uh, um, for that question, I think it depends on the perspective. For some, it will be a challenge. So they will not. Uh, lose that appetite to risk. In fact, they will be, you know, um, challenged to take risk. But for others, of course, it's uh, it's really in, in, the, in the perspective. You know, or for others, oh, okay, it's just a wait and see. Let's 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 study the situation. Let's look at COVID, and if it's done, and then let's not invest more. Let's not innovate. Let's not let's let's just try to. You know, uh, go go on with a day to day without taking risks. That's my take on that. Thank it's you, really Yusek. on a perspective. Thank you, Yusek. I hope the perspective from the OST and the rest of government would be about open mindedness. Yes. Uh, both to risk and to opportunities. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Yusek. The third Thank question you. that we have here. Oh. <laughs> What advice can you share in order to drum up the promotion and excitement over grassroots innovations in the country? Can we ask Dr. Gupta to answer this question? This is from Kat, from an anonymous participant. I guess she or he is shy. Uh, this is for uh, Anel, uh, Dr. Gupta and for Katrina. I would Let's say have that Dr. Gupta first. Sure. I would say that promotion of grassroots innovations uh, requires the first step. That's something we can do without waiting for any support from anywhere, practically, is to share whatever we learn from people in local language newsletters. And we should not restrict to only the online dissemination, because large number of people are outside the internet, even if they have a smartphone. And there are equally large number of people who, are do, who do not have a smartphone, at least in our country. 25% people only have smartphones. So if we only rely on apps and if we only rely on you know, net-based dissemination, then large number of people will remain out. So we should definitely require that this is one area where we should invest. Second is that public agencies so far, the maximum funding for scaling up of the grassroots innovation has come from public sector, from Ministry of Science and Technology mainly, but also from Department of Biotechnology and from other institutions. And uh, there is a great deal that we hear about venture funds, we great deal that we hear about angel funds, but none of them actually enter at a very early stage of the journey of a grassroots innovator. Not at all, I would say that. Now in Philippines, if the experience is different, I'll be very happy to hear that. But my own belief is that the state should come forward and make it easier for small people to take baby steps to take their ideas forward. Most of the time, innovators solve their problem. The Maze Haller solved his problem and then he will get on with the life. Now, how do other communities help get a piece of that Maze Haller? Now, if they want to get Maze Haller, somebody will have to get it fabricated. Somebody has to give the working capital. Somebody has to give material cost, get it made. And then share it with other communities who will test it, who will evaluate it, and then may like to borrow money to buy it. So it is not so easy to diffuse grassroots innovation, which do not have the support of advertising, do not have the support of publicity, do not have support, the media support, all of that is not available to them. So we really need hand-holding at a great deal. And I think, Anthony, what you have done and what Rex has done through your effort is admirable. I was very happy to hear that example, which I have tweeted just now, uh, which uh, secretary mentioned about tomato uh, cuttings, seedlings, I mean, tomato cuttings being used for spreading tomato plant. I have never heard of that. This is an amazing thing which I've learned today. And I must say to compliment, of the, to compliment the secretary and all of your colleagues that such innovations are a great uh, boon to the society at large because uh, you save the cost of seed from one plant, you can make so many seedlings. I mean, I'm illuminated by this idea. 
Now, such ideas need to be shared. I think this is not, we should not wait for that. We should not wait for anything. Share and maybe use help or take help of media also. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gupta, for those wonderful insights. Uh, Katrina, may we hear your thoughts on this? I absolutely want to echo Professor Gupta's take on this, right? It does take investment in, you know, again, for to be able to, to for, an, for an idea to spread, like, you do need to also not just look at investing in the idea and the innovation, but also the, you know, put the same kind of marketing that goes behind, you know, selling soda to people, right, behind telling these stories and getting them out there. So I think it's extremely powerful and important to look at this aspect also when you're um, considering how to support grassroots innovation, right? Like, I think with scientists, we have a te we, there's a tendency to like really focus just on the innovating part or the the mm -hmm. inventing part, right? As opposed to the marketing part. So that is one. I think the second thing is also to think about how to craft the messages, right? So to make them, you know, stories about people, about the impact they're creating, right? And again, there's a whole kind of set of expertise that's really all about this, right? And how to get people to adopt and understand certain types of products. So we need to give that type of support behind our grassroots innovations as well. And again, we found this to be very effective among startups, right? So, and I guess the third thing very briefly is also like in the context of COVID, right? You know, when there, when there are huge disruptive things that happen such as now, it actually kind of creates this window of opportunity also where people are reconsidering what their status quo is or what solutions they're currently adopting. And it creates a catalyst, right? For people to try new things. So. I would say, and you know, adopt new solutions, invest in them. So it, it is important to kind of take this particular window of opportunity, so to speak, right? To also perhaps um, look at, you know, maybe this is the opportunity for you to, you know, reset or try like a new innovation, right? That's out there. And it could be, you know, potentially a period of high growth, right? For spurring grassroots innovation and really seeing them to start to take off, so. Thank you, Katrina. Very nice answer to the question. We're down to our... Sorry, yeah, please. Yeah, please uh, proceed, uh, Yusek. Um, because I, can't, I won't be able to sleep if I will not share this. <laughs> I think we should make um, the grass, not just promote, not just you know the usual promotion campaign and all that, but really make it a movement, you know? a movement that will really grow, 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 and, and cover the entire country. We'll start with your region, but let's, let's make it as a movement. That's, that's, that, that's my take on that. So. We totally agree. Uh, you said uh, that's already in the plan for, for grassroots innovation, uh, for the grassroots innovation program. Thank you. Now, so such uh, a, just one, one second, I would only say that this is such a wonderful statement that sec Secretary made. And I would think that if you involve school children and you school, involve college students, yes. the youth, youth must be mobilized for this yes. movement. That they will go to the villages and learn. There should be assignment, there should be credit courses or credit assignments by which the students will go to the communities and document and take their prior informed consent and protect their rights. I mean, this can be a wonderful way of using, uh, converting a COVID-19 situation into a learning situation. Uh, all power to you, Secretary, all power to you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Kalingo would also like to provide an input. Yes, please proceed, Mr. Kalingo. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sales. I'd just like to share that uh, nothing beats uh, proof, proof, no, uh, success. And uh, if you are more successful with uh, a lot of these innovations, I think policy will follow. Policy without proof is, is difficult. And uh, one of the innovators uh, in the civil society movement in the 80s was able to, uh, to share the innovation and it became a national program. This is the community mortgage program. This is a hard technology. This is a social technology that developed, that enabled informal settlers to be able to buy, procure, and develop their lands. No? And this became a national program. Even now, it's being, being implemented. So what the NGO in Cebu did was to document everything 
can prove that it works. And uh, with all the ecosystem support. And the government adopted it. So it's a, it's a, it's a case of uh, an, an innovation, local innovation that was adopted and became a national program. I think we have lots of stories along that line. And I, th I don't think we should focus uh, innovation in, in pure technology because there are social technologies that provide solutions to education, health. There are a lot of NGOs doing that on a small scale. But I think we need to give them a platform that they may be able to share this and be replicated. So there are efforts on the ground. So we're not starting from zero in this, in this uh, innovation. Thank you. Mr. Kalingo, thank you so much. Uh, rest assured, we will take our cue from the experiences of previous programs and projects implemented as we go forward. And wonderful insights from uh, Yusek Brenda, from Professor Gupta, from uh, Katrina. So we're down to our two last questions. The fourth question is, based on the examples today, most GIs or grassroots innovations are high on impact. Say they become businesses or social enterprises, how can we ensure that there are funders, investors, interested to support these GIs to sustain themselves? So we'll start with uh, Katrina. Sorry, I was Katrina. Oh, yes. Um, so I, I'm a big believer that um, there should be early support to help these um, businesses or these innovations, right, get to the point where they can compete. But that at the end of the day, like for something to be sustainable, there has to be some kind of, you know, use case or provable demand or business model for the innovation for it to scale. And that inevitably, like investors will follow proof, as, um, as mentioned earlier, right? So, you know, there's so there's so there's a lot of interest right to invest in um, emerging economies and also these types of solutions. I think that's you know you can see that globally, right? But at the same time, like it is the onus also is on the innovator, right, to be able to get to that point where they can prove that they can scale, that there's adoption of their services, right? That um, that again, like that, and you know what we need to do is sort of help them get to that point where they can be sustainable, and that's how money kind of follows. So. That's, I, I'm not sure if that's a controversial view, but um, that's my take on it. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, Dr. Gupta, your thoughts on this? Yes, I would say that what I did, I will tell you first, that in the first two years, the only source of funding was my consultancy income. Being a management school, I used to do consulting and I used that funds. And subsequently, my speaking fees at various talks and so on and so forth and corporate talks, I have used that money to support this research and support the innovators and support the network. So I think charity begins at home unless we share our own piece of wealth, whatever we can afford, that doesn't matter how much it is. The, our legitimacy, our authenticity in seeking funds from other sources will not increase. So that is my first suggestion that we should begin, no matter how small we can, but we must begin from ourselves. The second suggestion I will make is that we should also try to persuade policymakers and I have tried that and succeeded. When the 13th Finance Commission of our country was thinking about how to scale up, I said, why can't you set up a district innovation fund? So there are 700 districts in our country. And we create about $400,000 fund in each district. It did not work very well, but nevertheless, it was provided to every district. So I think we need to go to the higher level of policy making. We should request the federal minister. We should request the government. We should go to the prime minister's office if necessary. You know, we used to organize festival of innovation at president of India's of house. We uh, we organized for from 2011, 12 till 2018. There were exhibitions of innovation, grass innovations that were organized at the president of India's house. That gave a big flip to the people. So I think the investors on their own would hesitate in investing an idea for which proof of market is not yet there. So government resources, I will insist, should be mobilized. Government should feel encouraged. It is a very powerful instrument for poverty elevation. It is a powerful instrument for empowerment of people. So under various programs, government should come, come forward. But at the same time, the foundation, the corporate social responsibility fund, I must say, has not flown a great deal. But I will still hope that in Philippines, the situation might be good. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Wonderful insights from 
from Katrina and Dr. Gupta. Do you know what? Yes, uh, you said, please proceed. Just a quick reply. Um, I think the very basic assistance should not be forgotten that we should help these innovators in uh, protecting if it's IPable. No, that's one. Second is I like the, the suggestion earlier by Professor Gupta. He said about risk capital. Probably we should we can have something like that and tap the innovation, the innovation app or innovation fund from the startup app that we just approved. I mean, the nation just the country just passed, no. And um, thirdly, uh, young proof of concept now that, that uh, all other speakers and panelists already mentioned earlier. Um, if we have that, probably it would be easier for us to get this GIs to investors and uh, the, the angel investors as well. Thank you. Thank you, Yusek, for your uh, suggestions or recommendations on uh, IP protection of grassroots innovations, the risk capital, and also, uh, I'm afraid uh, we're down, uh, we don't have much time. So we'd like to ask our speakers, uh, Dr. Gupta, Undersecretary Brenda, uh, thank you for your time. And allow me to extend my warmest gratitude to all our resource speakers, reactors, audience, and to everyone who contributed in making this event a success. On behalf of the OST 11, UNDP Philippines, and the Development Academy of the Philippines, thank you everyone for your support. I think we deserve a big round of virtual applause. That's a great pleasure. Thank you. Let me turn over space now to Dean Lizan Perante for the next part of this webinar. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Anthony Sales. So to our panel chair and to our speakers, and of course, to my fellow reactors, uh, you did a good job, an excellent one, and a very inspirational discussion on grassroots innovation. But the next question really is, how are we going to sustain the gains? You know? So Filipinos have the ability to create innovations that can lead to useful solutions while fast-tracking economic growth of the country. And I would like to quote a cat, of course. Um, she said that innovation is not just about for the sake of innovation. It's really about changing mindsets. No? And from Dr. Anil, I really love this one. Uh, build the ecosystem for G GI, starting with our children. So we have to start with the young generation. And this is about our intergenerational responsibility, taking care of the next and the future generation. And of course, from USEC Brenda, GI can spur growth and development, and DOST is here to advocate for the national implementation of GRIND. And from Dr. Salas, from the grassroots for the grassroots. So that's another uh, edifying discussion on grassroots innovation. And now allow me to introduce our next speaker who will talk about the Tawid COVID challenge. Francis Capistrano or Capi is the head of Experimentation Accelerator Labs, UNDP-PH. As the head of experimentation, he is currently working closely with the Zero Extreme Poverty Movement to find, test, and scale new ways of doing development. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Francis Capistrano. Right. Um, magandang hapon, magandang umaga sa inyo lahat. Thank you so much. Um, let me just share my screen. And I'm sorry for being in the way of lunchtime. Um, it's currently noon time in the Philippines. Um, hope you can see my screen and I just want to make, in a way, on behalf of UNDP, some sort of um, a sneak peek to what we're trying to cook up. Earlier we were discussing in the panel discussions and in the speeches um, the need to, to invest in risk, to, to try to catalyze um, early stage innovations and especially grassroots innovations who wouldn't have that um, capacity nor, nor the means to, to actually sell themselves, so to speak, and, and, and um, sell themselves and, so to speak, to, to, to gain financing and resources and a market for their innovations. So we, as, as Doc Lisan mentioned a while ago, um, UNDP Philippines is working with the Zero Extreme Poverty 
coalition and um, in the context of this new normal of COVID-19, we've been collaborating with Zero Extreme Poverty. That would include um, Sir Bobby Kalingos PEF and a um, hundred other, a um, hundred plus other NGOs. Um, we've been collaborating to try to assess and 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 see the condition of the on the of the poorest of the poor families in this pandemic. And we've seen that this new normal is actually has actually disproportionately hurt the poor and the vulnerable. It's kind of obvious for us to say. And um, I, I suppose um, just to reiterate the results of our joint survey with ZEP that we found that the incomes of 83% of the low income households have decreased. And the, these only highlight the precarious situation of the poor and the risk to achieving your SDGs. And I invite you to, 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 to look at our website for the, for the results of the COVID poll survey. Um, the pandemic, but, but on the other hand, we've seen how the pandemic has led um, many development actors, particularly civil society, whether they're formally uh, established or self-organized um, collective, collectives of friends. Many of them have found creative and innovative ways to help the poor in this part of the pandemic. We've seen how citizens have been monitoring the delivery of relief and deployment of public resources. We've seen how um, NGOs and um, ordinary citizens alike, community organizations have been crowdsourcing um, resources, relief goods and PPEs for the poor and um, communities and frontline workers. We've seen many try to create um, opportunities actually for livelihood from production of PPEs to bridging rural and urban supply chains um, as a way of addressing um, um, gaps in the market during, during, especially during the lockdowns. And um, what we in UNDP are thinking of and what we all are thinking of right now is, uh, is this problem. How might we convert these initiatives that are at the danger of being one-off initiatives actually, um, but are nevertheless driven by kindness, by passion, creativity, and activism even. How do we convert them and and help scale them into systemic efforts to address the new normal. And this is why we thought of the Tawid COVID Innovation Challenge. Um, please stand by for the official announcement, including the mechanics and the prizes. That's something that we're fleshing out and finalizing, knowing the risks involved. But um, essentially, what we I want to tell you about what we're looking for and what it is. So it's an innovation challenge that UNDP has put together. We want to find, improve, test, and scale novel grassroots solutions for social economic recovery. We want to recognize those innovative solutions that are already being implemented. We want to invest in solutions from the grassroots, from the beneficiaries themselves. And at the same time, we don't want the innovators to be working in their silos, in their in their bodega or in their in their um, um, laboratories, but we want to promote collaboration between various actors on the ground. And, and that's, um, as I said, um, we're we want to find, improve, test, and scale grassroots solutions that strengthen local convergence and social accountability. So these are the three areas where we're looking innovations in. So one is in social accountability. The other is in sustainable livelihood, um, building the capabilities and the assets of the poor. Um, and of course, trying to mobilize new resources. And um, in, in particular, we want existing solutions. We don't want, so, um, this is not your typical hackathon where, um, where, where, where ideas are, are, are pitched and, and conceived, but we want something that, uh, we want um, solutions that are already being implemented at, at, uh, at a small scale though, at, on the ground or working prototypes. We want, um, these solutions to be scaled um, at the local level through multi-sectoral implementation. What do we mean? Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, we want the innovators to also be working with local government, with civ local civil society, including the various ZEP members on the ground and, and other non-traditional actors. Um, we also will be having opportunities to, to, to provide tools and techniques that where that, that could enable innovators to test and measure the, the results of their innovations. And finally, we want, of course, to prioritize the poorest, most disadvantaged, and per, perhaps the most affected by COVID. Um, so stay tuned for the official announcement. Um, um, just follow us in our, in our, 
in our various social media accounts and on our website, of course, and you can copy the bit.ly to this way account. Um, and we hope um, moving forward through grassroots innovation and through a multi-sector cooperation and collaboration like what is happening right now, we will be able to empower our own, um, what do you call this um, version of Jugar, Professor, Professor Gupta. It's called Discarte. You will, uh, but at the same time, not all the Discarte, but also Bayanihan or, or stakeholder, um, multi-stakeholder collaboration para makatawid COVID. Thank you. I don't want to be in the way of your lunch. Magandang hapon sa inyo. Thank you, Dr. Lisan. Um, over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Kapi. So we have come to the end of our webinar this morning, the first of many. Again, we thank our speakers, our guests for spending their time with us today. And indeed, it is an honor for us at DAP Graduate School of Public and Development Management to collaborate with UNDP Philippines for the conduct of webinars under the theme, Reimagining Inclusive Innovation in the Post-COVID-19 Philippines. Have a good day, everyone. Hiraya Manawari.